you know, my job as a scientist is a slightly different job. It's to look at the the evidence and say, you know, please let's note that this is a gamble and um, take it from there. But but uh, I mean, I know we've and again, the people have already talked about the booster program potentially starting in September as well. But the science does show, and again, we use this word fractured or broken, what have you, but does show the link between deaths and hospitalizations has been weakened aggressively uh, by this stunningly successful program as well. Doesn't that give the platform for reopening? And possibly, you know, the, the science says that we're in a different place to where we were last January or February. Then, um, you know, the, the vaccine program was it was it was only just starting to kick in and high caseload translated into high hospital admissions and very high deaths. You know, in the UK at one stage, we had 1800 deaths per day. Um, now we're at 40, you know, 40, 40 or 45 deaths per day. So because of the vaccine, we're in a different place. But um, let's, you know, let's let's not kind of construe that as meaning that the NHS isn't under pressure. Um, NHS doctors aren't terrified of another wave. Um, you know, and there aren't still dangers out there. That's 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 all. Uh, can I ask you about the time frame that we're looking at here in the UK? Uh, the opening up day is coming here in, in July, but then there's not going to be another review until the 30th of September. It does strike me that we've got lots of people travelling, <clears throat> whether that's domestically or overseas. People come back and then they'll be going into the school system as well. Lots of people also returning to the office for the first time in many months. Is that time frame too long, given how quickly we're hearing about the virus surge? Well, I mean, when you ask if it's too long, um, you know, too long for what? Um, you know, as in, you know, is there any room for reconsideration or reversal? I suspect not. So, um, you know, as your, as the previous questions have have suggested, I think we're in a time where, as a matter of policy, not a matter of as a matter of science, we're kind of reappraising the way forward, the relationship with the virus. I think that is a gamble, um, but let's, let's see what happens. Danny, I don't know if I'm a hypochondriac or not. Probably is the answer. And, and I kind of think, oh, I don't right. feel as quite as sprightly as I did before this whole adventure as well. What do we know about long COVID and, 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 and the ramifications of it for the economy? Because I know it's something you've been doing such a massive, magnificent amount of work on as well. Are we learning a lot more about exactly what long COVID is and how we can treat it? I don't know about treating it yet. So, so you know, so I really urge you, to, you know, to look at the papers and, you know, let's not misconstrue it as hypochondria because, um, you know, the data are coming through thick and fast. And what it says is that um, of the, you know, whatever it is, 170 million people plus on the planet who've been infected by this virus, 10 to 20 percent of them have long term persistent symptoms that are very um, reproducible across the planet. Yeah, Whether you look in um, China or Bangladesh or France or the USA, what you see is people who have wheezing and breathlessness and fatigue and brain fog and that list of about 50 symptoms. So it really is a thing and it's a thing that's here to haunt us for a while yet. And it is you know, a price of, we have to pay that we have to look at in terms of people's lives and jobs and um, health care provision for them.